so what are your thoughts? Okay, now the latest brood, let's explain again the kind the brood that is going to emerge coming up this season. Yeah, so periodical cicadas are divided into broods, mm -hmm. which are regional. They're not really populations. They're not really species. It's kind of an accounting thing that we use to keep track of them. Right. And last year, we all heard about the periodical cicadas because brood 19, which is the largest brood of 13-year cicadas, so mm -hmm. cicadas with a 13-year life cycle, that emerged. And we also had an emergence of a kind of small brood of 17-year cicadas in the Chicago area. Interesting. This year, we have what's arguably the largest brood of 17-year cicadas. It gets down to sort of splitting hairs about whether this or brood 10, which was out four years ago, is larger. Mm -hmm. But this is as big as it gets for 17-year cicadas. It's going to be loud. <laughs> it's Well, yeah, it's going to be loud. In the emergences, there are always lots of cicadas out when they're out. But it's also going to be extensive. So you'll be able to see periodical mm -hmm. cicadas all the way from Cape Cod down into North Georgia. Wow. It, what was fascinating when we spoke a few months ago was that you were pointing out that this is like a buffet for the birds, right? Yep. All these huge cicadas. And it allows other insect, insects to reconstitute their populations. So one of the things is this, this is a, a, as far as birds and other animals in the forest are mm. concerned, this is kind of a rare event. It happens once every couple of years. We're just right. in a configuration right now where we had two big years in a row. And what that means is this is, this is easy prey. The birds and, and what have you are going to eat these insects yeah. uh, and they're not going to eat other things. So yeah. the other things are getting kind of a break this year. Very, very interesting. So you think this is sort of a cyclical occurrence? That's why they coincide, perhaps? Well, like, it's, it, you know, it, it's kind of funny. It, you get into the numerology of this. It just happened this way each time, this time around. Yeah. Remember that the 17 and 13 are both prime numbers. Right. So at this stage in the 221 year cycle, it's just mm. that brood 14 came out the year after brood 19. Next time around, it's not going to be that way. And Asking. for all the birds and other animals, next year is going to be a very lean year because there are no periodical cicadas out. Wow. wow. And I suppose if we broke this all down, it probably falls into Fibonacci numbers, right? Which is always oh, I, uh, <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> I, I always end up having to write it out on a piece of paper to make sense of it. That's a conversation for another day. So which parts of Massachusetts could see the most? The Cape? So it gets very patchy. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be on Cape Cod. And mm -hmm. weirdly enough, it's kind of uh, just over the bridges, just over the canal on the Cape Cod side to just about the elbow. So it's a very small area there, a very small area in uh, on Long Island, uh -huh. right around <laughs> Brookhaven. You were saying they like sandy areas? They don't. They don't like they sandy don't. areas. So I don't know oh. why they're on Cape Cod and Long Island. And then as you go further to the southwest, you're going to pick them up in the Appalachians. There's a big block of them in mm. Pennsylvania. Then they kind of peter out again because Brood 10 fits through there. Mm -hmm. And then they pick up again uh, further south and go all the way down into Georgia. And they're going to go west towards Cincinnati. So this is going to be a big year for the Cincinnati area. Sure. And, you know, these insects, do they burrow underground? Is that how they So they spend most, here, of, or is most of their lives yeah, underground. underground. And they're just feeding on plant roots. And this is the spring uh. for them to come above ground. They come up, they molt, and they turn into the adults. They have a couple of weeks to get adult things done, which involves mating and laying eggs. Mm -hmm. Then the adults die. It'll all be gone uh, before you know it. And we start the cycle over again. Wow. So when will we hear that distinctive cicada noise? So this is kind of a funny brood in that it does go very far south. But as this brood goes south, it also goes up in elevation. So mm -hmm. this is a uh, late May, June kind of thing. for Late May, June. We'll hear that. And it was interesting. You were saying that it's not that the cicada makes a noise. It has a membrane in its abdomen. And when wind goes through it, uh, that's what no, creates no, that distinctive male. sound. Male cicadas have special sound producing organs. Oh, okay. And what they do is they have a set of very strong muscles in their abdomens they can use to put tension mm. on these organs. And the surface of these structures, it looks like a ridged potato chip. Hmm. And when this structure vibrates mm. under tension, it makes a kind of a popping or crinkly noise at very huh. high speed. And it makes a sound. And then the abdomen of the male is hollow and works like a resonator. 
and the mm. sound is radiated out of the abdomen. Only the males make these kinds of loud sounds. So you're only going to hear half of the cicadas out there because the females, they can make sounds, but they're very quiet. They don't have these sound producing organs. Very interesting. I know sometimes when we have uh, the gypsy moth or other insects like this, it can damage trees or you know, any damage caused by the cicada to trees or lawns. Yeah. So, you know, the problem with gypsy moths is that they're not native to our area. So they just chew up our trees and it's kind of an all around disaster. Yeah. But the cicadas, the periodical cicadas are native species. And they're very old species. The species themselves go back a couple of million years. Wow. So they have made their peace with our forests. And although it can look uh, as though they have damaged the trees because you get this phenomenon called flagging, where the ends of the twigs die and turn huh. brown, that actually doesn't seem to have any significant long effects on long-term effects on these forests. Oh. So it, it'll look kind of strange in places, especially where they're very dense. Uh, but in the end, it's just part of our eastern deciduous forest. And it really is something quite unique. There's nowhere else in the world you can go and see anything quite like this. Yeah, fascinating. A relative sent me a recording from last year of how loud they were in North Carolina. Yep. Um, when was the last time Massachusetts or New England saw a, a lot of cicadas like this? Well, you see, we have brood two that gets up into Connecticut, and mm -hmm. that was last out in 2013. Okay, so it's been a while. And back in 2030, that's going to come up into Connecticut. Doesn't quite get to Hartford. Right. So uh, and the other one is this brood 14, which, gosh, it was last out in 2008. Yeah, wow. So, you know, we talk a lot about climate change and the effects it has on various species. Yeah. Any effect from climate change on this regular cycle of cicadas? So I get that question a lot. And yeah. the answer is, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and we know that to be true because if you look at where they live and you think about just Cape Cod, but we can think about all of the, the areas they live. What was Cape Cod like 10,000 years ago? Well, this is an area that was glaciated. Iceberg, right? Yeah, exactly. So they certainly weren't living there. Mm. All of this brood structure and all these populations are younger than you know, on the order of 10,000 years, but the species are millions of years old. So hmm. they have a long history of responding to the climate and they move, they go extinct, all those kinds of things. So will climate change affect them? Yeah, because it always has affected mm. them. Yeah. What exactly will it do to them? Well, that's one of the reasons that we do the mapping is that we'd like to get a baseline for what these distributions actually look like. Mm -hmm. We have some predictions. We put them up on the website. One of the things that we predict could happen if the climate warms, and it has been warming uh, substantially and very rapidly, is you're going to start to break down the cycles. Mm -hmm. And you'll see more and more of these straggler emergences or off-cycle emergences. So one of the things we fully expect to see this time around, we are... Again, it sounds like numerology. 2025 is four years before brood one. Yeah. And brood 14 and brood one are adjacent. 2025 is also four years after brood 10. And brood 10 and brood 14 are adjacent. Plenty of cicadas in broods one and 10 are going to make mistakes this time around. And they're going to get reported as brood 14. They're not really brood right. 14. They're just right. stragglers. And the, the point of keeping track of those things is to see if we can detect any changes in mm. the frequency of straggling. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly did see that with Brood 10 last time around. There was a big emergence in, I think, Princeton, New Jersey, four years before Brood 10 was supposed to come out. Wow. Interesting. So recording these things, that's how we get an understanding of how uh, the, the current state of climate change is going right. to affect these cicadas. That's why it's important. Yeah, I heard a scientist once say when the iceberg pulled away that formed Cape Cod, all of the kettle ponds that dot the Cape, yeah. that's the leftover deep water ponds from the iceberg, right? Yeah, chunks so of ice Chunks of ice got left behind. They took longer to melt. And so you end right. up with these funny... I, I live in a place where the, those little kettles are everywhere. And it's just... So interesting. I, I live near the edge of the ice face at yeah. one point during the glaciation. And you never know it now. I mean, it looks like forest. Exactly. Exactly. And what about um, pets and animals? You know, for dog owners, if a dog eats a cicada, <laughs> you know, some of them are big, they're curious. Is it harmful in any <laughs> yeah. way? Is it okay if a dog or a cat eats one? So we uh, there there is a literature on this. Uh, you know, dogs dogs are dogs, right? Yeah. And they'll, they'll eat anything. They'll eat anything. Know. 
and they'll eat too much of anything. Yeah. And that's where things sort of go wrong because there are, <laughs> I don't know, this is kind of a family show here. I'm not sure what we can say and what we cannot say. They get severely clogged up if they eat too many. They do. And and I, I leave it to your imagination what that looks like in a dog, but it ain't pretty. Yeah, yeah. So no. you kind of want to not. You want to not you don't want to them. find that one out. Eat um, those. No. Yeah. No. yeah. My Jack Russell Terrier would totally have played with one yeah. of those, but I don't and think. And then, then we get people who want to talk about people eating them. Yes. And Protein. then all I, all I can say about that is there is a, some literature about how they are mercury bioaccumulators. Mm. And so they, and there's a body of literature on that. We have the references on the website. Uh, you could be eating a little dose of mercury. They're not approved for food use. They're not mm -hmm. tested. So you don't know. You don't want chocolate covered cicadas. Uh, I don't. All right. <laughs> <laughs> don't need All any right. more brain damage. So right? fascinating. We'll be listening for them professionally. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Sure.